Welcome to The Switch, not another podcast. The Switch is a collaboration between Baseload Capital, DNB, and Energy Disruptors, aiming to accelerate the green transition. We want our podcast to be a central hub for knowledge exchange within the fields of renewables and green transition. Hosted by Kristina Hagström Ilyevska and produced by Emil and Jacob. Welcome back to The Switch, not another podcast. No, 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 we are here to do something else. We want to talk about heavy topics with heavy people in a very easy, smart and tasteful way. Today we have a super interesting guest. She is the CEO of the Swedish branch of DNB, one of the biggest banks in Scandinavia. A bank that is not only being a role model in how we invest, but also leading the parade when it comes to energy and climate questions. I'm collecting some some energy here now to ask the really tough questions for Elizabeth when she comes here. And if you would like to know a bit more about who she is, what she has done, here you go. Listen in on our introduction of Elizabeth Besko. She's been named one of Sweden's most influential businesswomen. For years, she's been shattering glass ceilings as she advanced her career in traditionally male-dominated fields, such as investment banking and finance. Today, as a highly regarded leader in banking, she is a persistent advocate for diversity and inclusion, aiming to transform the industry and break the barriers she once faced herself. As CEO for the Swedish branch of the Norwegian bank DNB, She is part of another transformation, turning a world-leading bank in shipping, offshore and seafood industries into a catalyst for green energy transition. Let's jump right into the interview with Elizabeth Beskow, CEO of DNB, equality advocate and change maker. What a woman we have with us here today. What about that introduction, Elizabeth? Warm welcome to the studio of The Switch. Thank you very much. So listen, I want to go straight into this conversation. But first, I need to warn you about a couple of rules. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. So you see this button over here? Yes. Yeah. It's a bullshit button. <laughs> so whenever I push it, bullshit. that means we have to explain it once more. Because I promised my mother that <laughs> she will be able to understand what we're talking about. So we really need to go down to the specific and the easy talk. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. There's also another rule, but I, I'm sure that uh, this is a rule I don't have to explain to you. It's called no mansplaining. You um, definitely. I do understand what you mean. You do. I, yeah. Have you have you ever like experienced it? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, Sometimes. yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we haven't found the word for woman's blaming, but um, we I kind of know the concept at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Guy guessing. We don't do guy guessing. Either. No guy guessing either. No. But um, uh, we can do killrekligt, as we say in Sweden. Okay. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. That's a good word. <laughs> Because uh, this is really <laughs> about the people uh, and what we actually want to say. So welcome to uh, to the switch again, once again. I, and uh, I want to pick up on on a conversation you were in a couple of weeks ago where you were part of a um, conference and uh, I picked up on a quote there where you said energy transition our greatest opportunity and challenge we must work more on transformation than finding disruptive solutions in the future so this is this is a very many many nice words in a sentence here but I really don't understand what it means Can you explain this to me? Yes, I think for a bank um, uh, as us, uh, it's going to be extremely important to understand the risk involved, especially when it comes to climate risks uh, for our company. Of course, the the social part and the the governance part will also be extremely important. But for us to actually judge companies, take two companies in the same line of business, yeah. Uh, two car companies, um, they have the same risk in their sector. 
Uh, but one of them is handling that risk much, much better than the other ones. So what could the risk be? The risk is actually cl the climate risk we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we say that the recycling, mm -hmm. see, if, if it comes to recycling, yeah. uh, one of them is doing it a lot better. They have long contracts. They are thinking about the environmental issue long term and it's a part of the strategy. But yeah. the other companies like, no, None of our business. We just give it away to someone that probably do something with it, but we don't know. Okay. So for me, that is kind of two companies that are taking care of the inherent risk in their sector because there will always be leftovers that needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, as a bank, looking into that kind of risk, of course, I would like to lend the, com lend the company that actually takes care of the full uh, value chain or the circular value chain into their company uh, and what they're doing compared to the other ones. So what I mean is kind of an opportunity. It's going to be an opportunity for me to judge risk in the sector and lend money or have a client that actually act in a way that is good for the environment. So can I translate it into that banks nowadays really have the power to choose to promote a company that does better for the world than the other one? Yes. And that is actually, actually something also that is, full, full, is followed up by the, uh, the um, surveillance, uh, and the uh, FSA or the, uh, the... What's the FSA for people it, who don't know? It is the um, Financial Supervised Authority that actually oh, monitoring... They sound very... They, very... Is, they are very tough. But all of a sudden, uh, two years ago, they did not ask about this kind of risk. That is kind of their, one of their main topics today. How do you handle the risk from you know, en environmental, social, and government risk for the companies. So that is extremely important. And it's, of course, it could also be around uh, diversity. Um, could could be a lot of question how you actually uh, run the company from a, if, if you don't care about diversity, if you don't care about the social part, uh, that is also something that we will look more closely to and actually give, you know, give points in our system how we actually judge that company. Honestly, I'm, I'm so close in pushing the, the button here, but ah, not really. But the, the thing that I would like, okay, I'll do it. Shit. These FSA, hmm. how do we know that they are the right guys to judge this? How do we know that they really go into details and make the right assessment in this case? We don't. <sighs> <sighs> that makes it difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so lead me through this desperation now. What can I, mean, we... I, I, I think that, of course, they are new into this as well. Yeah. Uh, but we have a taxonomy from uh, the European Union. Uh, we, we are starting to get rules and recommendations and how to run this in a good way. And I think, of course, it's kind of a, the, the best practice of the industry, I mm -hmm. think, will evolve here. But I also think a lot of investors that are looking into us as a bank, they do not want to take risks um, by us lending out money to customers mm -hmm. that are not uh, in a good place when it comes to the ESG risk that we've been talking about. And ESG stands for? Environmental, social and governance. ESG, yeah. Write that up. ESG. Emil, do you know what ESG is now? Yeah, I do. Yeah, good. What I realize when I'm listening to you, it's going to be a lot of pressure on the future leadership, yes. like having the right people, making the conscious decisions and all of these. How, how do we make sure that we have the right leaderships in all of these parts? What is your thought on that? I, I, I've just uh, come over an extremely, and it's an old one actually, from uh, Brittany Brown. I'm not sure if you've heard of her. She talks about vulnerability. Yeah. And if you have that, you can actually lead innovation, creativity, and change. It's such an important tool. So, uh, to be, do you mean that we need to be vulnerable yes. as leaders? Yeah, okay. because I, I think a lot of what we see today is that leaders who think they know everything will not be or will not have the right trait to actually lead into the future. I think you need to be a leader that wanna learn it all compared to a leader that know it all. Oh, so that means that I will get rid of all the know-it-all out there? 
I don't think so, but oh, but since it gets had a small hope, you had a small hope, <laughs> small. but the more complex it gets, uh-huh. you know, you will not stand alone as a leader. Mm. You need to be vulnerable, and I think that you need to, you know, get a team where you can ask for help and that you can share knowledge. Um, and I also think that from a diversity perspective, the more diverse both when it comes to men and, and women, but also when it comes to ethnicity, will actually create more dynamic team in the future. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the role of the leader, it's, it's more ab- about, so to say, I think a bit being inspiring, uh, but also to kind of ask question, mm-hmm. an ask question leader. I think that's going to be good for the future. So, an ask a question leader, then, okay, then I have a good question for you here. I have actually three good questions for you here that Mm. we're going to roll into now. So, you're going to get a choice here. So, we're going to get to know you a bit more as a leader. So, if you got to pick one of these questions... Mm. One of them. One of them. Okay. Okay. Mm. So tell us what you've done for the planet this week. What's the most stupid thing you've seen this week regarding the climate? And what is your guilty pleasure around the climate question? Oh, Which my, one? The guilty pleasure. Ooh, okay. You're yeah. a brave one. Yeah, Thank you for that. Come on, come on, come on. I I use coffee pods. And, oh, and you are an espresso girl. Yes. And it's not only kind of two, it's ten per day. Do you want? Me to admit something to you? Yes, please. I have the same. Oh. I love those Nespresso yes. pods. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. I, I, I completely yes. understand you. Mm. Um, so basically, what what do we do? I mean, what do we do for all these small guilty pleasures? Do we can we can you find an easy way out of it? Because you can coach me here now. I. I yeah. I pick litter when I'm out walking the dogs. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. I have to say my kids do not appreciate that part. <laughs> uh, but I. Well, you have a little bag with you. Yeah, since I always have kind of poo bags for the dogs yeah. with me. Uh, it's easy to, to pick litter and then just put in the bin when I get back home. But they kind of call me the, the kind of the bag lady, you know, you know, who goes around fine things. <laughs> That's okay. But I also guess it's a challenge to, uh, we need to find, so Nespresso, if you're out there, we need to find a solution where we can enjoy our coffee without having this bad conscience. Because I think that both you and me, uh, we will stop with it if it doesn't come to uh, a different situation. Or what do you think? I think so. And I think that they are, of course, working on it. And and they are, you know, prepared to, I think, go the extra mile. Uh, But they don't, really have, I think, an efficient uh, system for for the customer to really feel that you are recycling the, the pods. No, to give us, come on, give us a help so that yes. we can drink it yeah. with a good mm. conscience. Yeah. <sighs> we mm. really put ourselves out there. We need to ask Emil so that he can come clean about something. Come on, give us, what are your guilty pleasures? Guilty pleasure. Yeah. Uh, okay, m- my guilty pleasure is that I have a motorcycle from 85. Oh my Ooh. God, so with- we are... With straight pipes, so I, I know. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that, that's my guilty pleasure. Okay, yeah. well, well, now we have a better conscience. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But you know what? I think it's really uh, why we have this co- uh, conversation is because I really think it's important to realize uh, just the consciousness about what is actually not good that I'm doing for the society and for the climate and for the energy transition. So I think that we do a high five on yeah, that. Yeah, we do. Good one. Good. Good. Mm. Great. Okay, so. Now, I will push the corporate bullshit bottom before, okay? Oh, because we're going down dirty now, Elizabeth. Are you right. ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. So you're a bank. You're talking about green, green, uh, green thinking. You're taking conscious decisions. But I think that everybody knows that it's also a Norwegian bank, and we also know that the Norwegians are investing a lot in oil, which is not only uh, not a good thing for the climate in itself. So I would really like to hear your thoughts on a big question like this. I think it's it's fair to say that the ENB is part of the Paris Agreement. So we, of course, working in the direction of of getting the CO2 down to zero by 2050. And I also think that that working with our customer 
and not against them is the really key to this question. So we need to help them do the transformation from where they are today into something new. But how can you help them? I mean, you're a bank. We can actually uh, put requirements, as I said before, the how we actually look at the risk in the sector. Mm. We are saying that the risk for this company, you need to improve uh, on these s- topics in order to be okay for us to actually lend money to you. Mm. But then also we can start, I would say, different kind of discussion with our clients to actually how to transform the industry mm. and i think that we have we've been talking before you and i uh, we see that uh, we we can find synergies between some uh, energy tech company and the oil business um, which i think is extremely interesting and we can also see that we have clients that really have started to, to think about this transformation. We can see that uh, Equinor, who is the big one, uh, is doing a lot of uh, offshore wind um, in order to trying to do this transition uh, in a wise way. But I mean, oil is such an important part of the Norwegian uh, business life. So this will be a transition more than something that we stop doing. However, I have to say that we have actually reduced about seven billion dollars uh, of exposure in this sector. So we are trying to go the right way. Uh, and of course, then uh, taking that capital, we very clear goals into the renewable sector. Interesting. I mean, uh, <clears throat> when when you look at it from that perspective, what, what do you think that the responsibility regarding climate is when it comes to the oil business? What do you think that they should move ahead with? I... I, I, I... I mean, this is going to be personally uh, from my side. I think that they right now need to, in one way, admit that the oil that we have found is enough. Uh, so stop looking for new oil. Mm. <laughs> uh, that would be one part. Um, I would say that that I would like to see from the oil industry, but also that they think about how can they use their uh, skills, their prof- professionality, their equipment in other ways uh, in, in order actually to transform and to find new sources of energy for the future. And I think that is what they need to think. And also having a, a business perspective, even though, I mean, we have said kind of the last 10 years that is going to be, we need oil for another 20 years and we just push that limit. Uh, but I also would say when it comes to Norway, it's a clear sign in the last election now that actually this is going, it's starting to become important also for um, uh, the common person uh, in Norway. Mm. Uh, we see a change in, in the leadership uh, from the government. Um, so it's going to be ex- extremely interesting to see how that actually will affect and I think that that will also affect the rest of the world because we are looking at Norway as a um, as an example of good finance in a sense. So that yeah. I hope that many countries will follow mm. follow the thoughts there as well. Uh, what kind of uh, if we're talking about a little more about this construction uh, conscious restructuring? How would it look like if we're moving forward with businesses overall? I think that we will have. We will transfer a lot of capital from the was it, so old uh, business um, over to other industries and foremost, I would say, renewables, where we can actually finance a solar park in uh, Chile. Uh, we can find something down in Africa or in, in uh, we can find something in Australia. I think that we can go bigger when it comes to renewables in order to support support the climate in, in, um, in a broader perspective. Um, so that is one part. But I also think, as I said, that... Um, the so the, would you say that, sorry to interrupt you here, yeah. but would you say then that the finance industry really has a responsibility when it comes to the energy and climate debate? Yes. And I think that the day the capital decides fully that this is important, then we will see the change. And, and how far along do you think we have come so far? I mean, if we're I, I, 100% I, I, ready or not. I, I, I say that we... Uh, if I should be positive, on a positive note, yeah. I would say maybe we have come half through, 
Um, and especially from uh, an investor perspective, I think it's much more discussion about what they actually invest in. Because in the end, it's you and my pension, uh, our savings that they are actually are, you know, doing things with and trying to get the, so we have some retirement to look forward to. So I think the investor side it looked much, much better. The banks still have a way to go, but still uh, with new models and especially models that focus then again on the ESG risks, we will see a change. And the capital is something that actually is absolutely crucial to make this change happen. So with that said, I have a really interesting question that I would like our partner, Graham Edge, to pose because it's actually on the topic. So, uh, Graham, why don't you put your question on uh, online? In contrast to many contemporary climate change debates, is it false binary to talk about supporting economic growth or protecting the environment? How do you challenge people to see that these goals are not in conflict? Oh, it's. Um, I, I think it's it's a, an extremely interesting question. But again, um, if you take the oil industry as an example. We have seen, you know, a reduction. We have seen that we need to use this kind of a competence in in other industries, um, which of course, then we, if we go to renewable or to offshore wind industry, that's been extremely big in, in Norway, for example, we can actually use the old competence into new uh, industries that actually is so much better for the climate. We, we new jobs, um, new re re revenues comes out of these new industries that was in the old one before. So I would say it's never conflicting. Uh, it's never conflicting. It can't be conflicting. Um, I guess that if it would be conflicting, we would be in a really bad situation. Yes, we would. Yeah. What do you reckon the leaders of the world need to do if you would give one advice? Be more vulnerable. Vulnerability, I think, is going to be the thing that saying that we are not certain we need to act together. Uh, in order actually to make change happen. And I think being so certain that so many leaders are today uh, because they think that that is necessary, that is something that I need, I feel that I that really need to change in order for us to, to make a, a change in how we actually lead the world to a better place. We need to be more kind to the planet uh, because that's the only planet we have. One reflection I did a couple of years ago was I attending a, um, a course with um, Singularity University. We had a guy professor within the energy uh, sector, but we were also discussing the, um, all the things we're doing in space. And I think everyone thinks that we are looking for uh, a new planet to live in or to live on when the earth is kind of gone and we have done mm -hmm. all the bad things with it. So that's where we're spending all the money over there, yeah? Exactly. But the thing is that the reason why we do space uh, travels, we go to Mars and we check out things, is that we want to preserve the planet Earth because it's, there is no planet or plan B. It's just our planet and that is so important to remember. Wow, that's a very passionate way of saying it. Thank you very much for that. And, and, and maybe I stole your thunder here because you were going to talk about something that really like makes you en uh, engaged and frustrated or committed or, <laughs> or, or happy. So uh, if you would like, is that a topic or is there another topic that another we have some? Okay, uh, shoot, because give us I, your switch. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about uh, vulnerability. I'm not sure why it's such a difficult English word. Brittany Brown, Texas uh, professor, uh, Houston University, did a TED talk uh, back in 2010 where she talk about these things. And I think it's even more interesting to listen to today because that will help us drive innovation, create creativity and make things happen and make things change. So please spend 12 minutes, have a look at Brittany Brown uh, when she talks about uh, this topic uh, and when she almost had a breakdown and herself needed to go to the shrink in order to fix it.
Well, that's actually 12 minutes I really advise you to take. I've seen it and it's really, really good. Emil, can we make sure that people get it? Yeah, of course. Make sure that you check out the link that we're going to push with this. But I hope maybe, Emil, we can like give him a sneak peek. What do you say about that? Yeah, of course. Like, putting Elizabeth and Brene in the same kind of topic. <laughs> that gives us a bit of room. Yeah. That gives yeah, us yeah, a yeah. bit of power. Good. Thank you. And we perfect, most dangerously, our children. Let me tell you what we think about children. They're hardwired for struggle when they get here. When you hold those perfect little babies in your hand, our job is not to say, look at her, she's perfect. My job is just to keep her perfect, make sure she makes the tennis team by fifth grade and Yale by seventh grade. <laughs> That's not our job. Our job is to look and say, you know what? You're imperfect and you're wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. That's our job. Show me a generation of kids raised like that and we'll end the problems I think that we see today. In the end now, if you would pick an initiative, a person, an organization, what would you pick? Who would you like to give some really nice sunshine? Sunshine. I think I actually leave the climate uh, a bit and then it's then hope hope I can get over to one of my other topics that I think is extremely important as well, and that is uh, diversity. And I think the way uh, we can work with diversity um, and uh, the our new organization, Diversity Charter, is one of those organizations that is really doing very good. And I think that the more diverse we get, we do not get stupid decision taken by the homogeneous group of person. Um, we get so much I more love into this, mm -hmm. and that is something mm. I really would like to highlight and uh, and ask a lot of other companies to also join Diversity Charter because the more we are, um, the more we can get out of each other and share information and learn and be a learn it all instead of a know it all. You know, if I would have a, a different button here, I would probably push it and they would go like fireworks and stuff. Yes. Because I think yes. you said it, if we are a diverse group of people, we will not make the, the, the stupid decision. Mm. So if you're educated and you have the diversity, we will make better decisions. Exactly. So thank you very much for that, uh, Elisabeth. It's been an honor having you here. And I'm so happy to continue to work in this switch uh, focus that we have here today. So. Thank you very much for being Thank with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a very interesting talk and I hope I, I didn't have that much corporate uh, language and that everyone actually really understood. I think you nailed it. it Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> good job. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. My summary of today's conversation are following. First of all, I really think that she says it in a good way that we need to nurture a good leadership with a conscious mind that will make sure that we do the right things. For example, that we had the surveillance uh, structure around the bank and who gets the points, as to, so to speak. We need to have the good leadership there to make sure that they do the right decision and promote the right type of companies for the future. I also think that to get those leaders, we need to show vulnerability. And she says it so well. The new leadership is about learn it all, not know it all. If you are a know it all, go back to the books and learn it all and be vulnerable in asking questions because we don't have the answers moving forward. That's true. But if we can do it together, we can help each other out. It's going to be so much easier. So show your vulnerability, definitely. A different thing that I think she picks up on a very good way is that diversity is the key that we need in order to move on. That's what we need right now. So let's make sure that we have a diverse group of people that are making these decisions that will make us not make the bad decisions moving forward. And last but not least, I love how she answers it so clearly, so direct. Does the finance industry have a responsibility within this? She said, yes, and I agree. They have a responsibility, but so do you. 
So remember, it's not only about what others can do, it's also about what you can do. So switch it on next week and subscribe as well. And make sure that you send us thoughts, for, uh, questions and so on so that we can have a continuous discussion with you. Have a great week and see you later.